Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining uh, this, the latest uh, webinar in a series of social leadership webinars run by Sea Salt Learning. My name is Paul Draper, and I'm joined by Julian. Hello, Julian. Um, before we get started, just to let you know that this is the 11th in a series of 12 um, social leadership webinars, and the subject today is on collaboration. Uh, we're going to record this session as we have done with all the sessions so far. If you'd like to find any of the other sessions that we have, in including this one, uh, which will be uploaded shortly. Um, you can find them on our YouTube um, channel at Sea Salt Learning. Uh, for future webinars, you can check out the events page on our website as well. Uh, just to let you know, you can ask questions throughout the um, webinar. We'd be very pleased to uh, field your questions. Um, you can do this in the chat or the Q&A boxes you can see on the Zoom interface, um, and we will make sure that those get answered. If you just set them to all panelists and attendees uh, so that everybody can see your questions, that would be really helpful. So it leads me to hand over to uh, our Sea Salt captain, Julian Stodd. Hi, Julian. Hello, Paul. Hello, everyone. So, uh, yep, I think we're ready to go. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, thank you all for joining today uh, to take a trip through collaboration. I was quite pleased the last webinar we did was on co-creation and uh, somebody wrote a, uh, a nice review of it saying quite a quirky session but interesting anyway. So I shall aim for that today, uh, both quirky and interesting. Uh, perhaps we should also aim for effective because of course one of the points of looking at social leadership is to help us to be more effective in this new world that we live within in the social age and effectiveness is probably about collaborating collaborating inside an organization, so with your peers and colleagues, and collaborating in communities like this, open communities, where we're not held together through contracts, through legal ties, or through formal organizational structure. We're held together in a community of ideas. But if we're going to collaborate, there must be some specific skills for collaboration. There's the social capital we looked at before, which is about one's ability to survive and thrive in this space to understand the rules um, but there's also something specific about collaboration that's what we'll explore today so as paul said this is number 11 in a series of 12 which is frightening uh, really for illustrating how fast this year has swept by um, we just have one more left to go in this series uh, which as you can see is going to be social leadership in practice next month um, and I've always represented the social leadership journey as a circle because it's not really that you go through a course and you become a social leader. You become a social leader when you decide to become a social leader and you take the actions that a social leader would take. Actions based on a foundation of humility, on a foundation of fairness. Once we start to be generous with our time, but also our ideas, once we help others to succeed, perhaps we're on that journey to, to social leadership. I've put here on the right, this is a, a working out loud session. Any of you that know my work will know that it's all about um, working out loud. It's an iterative, um, experimental way of working where you share your thinking as you go. You share your well-developed ideas, but you may also share your less complete ideas and ask for, for feedback and engagement to help to make them better. So this session will very much be in that spirit. Uh, in fact, uh, many of the slides I'm sharing today, uh, I've never shared before. They're slides from, uh, they're pages actually, from the uh, new Social Leadership 100 Days book. And this really represents a whole new iteration of, of my thinking and working around uh, social leadership. So we'll see if we can find a narrative around them together as we embark upon our, our social leadership journey. Um, and it's worth thinking about it like a journey because uh, if you're anything like me when you take a journey there may be the odd detour uh, we may occasionally get lost and sometimes there are these emergent wonderful views so we'll try to incorporate a little bit of all of that in today's quirky journey so i uh, i was making some notes I, i've started in these um sessions putting in uh just starting with a few bullet points really of, of what the topic means and I was thinking about this for collaboration. Um, it's definitely about an ability to connect, but it's not just passive connection. I think collaboration has to have an active, creative 
uh, part to it. So we're collaborating to get something done. Um, there may be times when we're just in communities, but we're not collaborating in an active sense. We're just kind of hanging out together. We have the potential for collaboration. Uh, but I, I wanted to sort of bring in that active aspect of it. And then you will already have heard me use this word once already, effective. You know, social leadership is about helping people to be more effective. So then what else is collaboration about? Well, when I was thinking about uh, social capital last month, I, I was really trying to focus on this, this um, generosity, this mindset of generosity. So perhaps a big part of collaboration is this mindset of generosity and the desire for others to succeed. So we're not just collaborating so that we can be more effective ourselves. We're collaborating to help others to be successful. But it is, of course, a, a circular, uh, dare I say, almost karmic process. If we help others to be successful, then they will perhaps help us to be successful, or at least at a community meta level, that will be the case. So we start with a, a mindset of generosity. And then this other piece was interesting, and I'll tell you why I was thinking about this. It's because I'm working with a technology company at the moment that's interesting, interested in collaborating. But whilst I find that much of the language is about collaboration, what they're really looking to do is win. Um, they're really acting with a mindset of competition, not collaboration. And so that made me, you know, in that spirit of working out loud, of thinking, well, what's the strength of our position? So what do we bring when we come to collaborate? But what are we willing to invest from that? So it's almost we come to collaboration, not with a saver's mindset, but with a spender's mindset. You know, what can we put in to this collaboration to make it uh, be successful. And then, you know, I've, I've put in this piece, which is a foundation of social leadership, taking actions um, of fairness, uh, empathy, and support. So it's viewing collaboration, and I'll come back to this theme, as something that we create. Collaboration may be an emergent feature of a healthy cultural system. So by acting fairly, demonstrating empathy for others and supporting others to be successful, we may end up with collaboration uh, without having to do anything additional to that. So I thought I'd start there. And then going back to that point about collaboration being an emergent feature of a system, we can then start to think of everything that goes on in these terms. Do any of the actions taken by the organization, taken by the community, or taken by us as individuals, either inhibit or enable collaboration. And we can probably be quite stark in our assessment of this. So organizations definitely talk about collaboration a lot. You know, they want collaboration to take place, but often the actions they take inhibit that very collaboration from taking place. Now that can be through a range of factors. They can inhibit it because people are simply too busy to collaborate effectively. So they can collaborate transactionally, but not um, effectively, because collaboration is certainly more than transaction. They can do it because their mechanisms of, um, of, of recognition and reward simply don't factor in collaboration. And although it's a bit trite to say it about these things that get measured get done, there is a truism in that, that if we don't recognize collaboration and both nurture it and reward it, then perhaps less of it is going to get done, or at least less of it at the organisational level. We're probably always going to collaborate as we are now outside the network because that's entirely under our control. So we can inhibit collaboration through overly aggressive rules, through controlling permission, through a lack of freedom, but we can enable it in different ways as well. And and one of the things we'll, we'll think about in this session is the difference between um, space and as an enabler and specific skills of enablement. So if we want people to collaborate, there has to be a place or a space for them to do so and perhaps a purpose for them to do so. But then there are also very specific skills around collaboration. And that's very much what we're thinking about in terms of social leadership. What are the um, specific enablers of collaboration. So, you know, all of this takes place within our communities. And in the third of the webinars, I think it was, we, we looked at community and community and social leadership is very important because we don't just belong to one community. 
we belong to many different communities. Sometimes we're in formal communities and formal communities are ones which are defined by the organization. If you work within a team or you work within a department or a country unit of some sort, then you have a place within the formal system. And organizations have one formal system. It's held together by bonds of power. So your job title, perhaps, your email address, um, the rules that govern you are all held by that formal system. Now, people tend to uh, collaborate within a formal system uh, perhaps because they have to, you can certainly impose certain types of collaboration, certainly transactional collaboration on people within a formal system, within those bonds of power. But within our social systems, our other communities, they cross over this structure. They don't all sit within one formal team, they sit across formal teams and they don't just sit within the organisation, they reach out from the organisation itself. And these types of communities aren't held together by bonds of power. They're held together by something different, which is, oh, seems to be showing us a blank slide on my uh, screen. Let me go back and see what's going on there. Okay. Well, I don't know if you can see that slide, but uh, on my laptop, it, uh, it was showing blank. So apologies for that. But it should say, it should replace that with bonds of trust. So um, the social system is held together with bonds of trust rather than power. So with that in mind, a core skill for social leaders is to understand the flow of trust, to understand how trust is earned and how it is countered sometimes by consequence. So if I just jump back to this, um, an inhibitor of collaboration is certainly going to be a lack of trust and an enabler of collaboration, both within and outside the system, is going to be uh, to have trust. But trust, of course, is a fickle thing. I'm doing some very interesting research at the moment. And if you've been to any of the, the previous sessions or the trust webinars I'm running at the moment, you'll apologize, uh, um, excuse me for repeating myself on some of that. But we're doing some quite large scale research looking at how trust flows within systems. Um, trust between individuals like you and me. Trust within communities and teams like the community we're assembled in here today and then trust in organizations themselves, sometimes called institutional trust. And what is very interesting um, is that trust seems to flow uh, more easily sideways than it does up and down. So within this type of structure, we see that trust actually can cross these formal structures quite easily if it's going horizontally, so between people who are at the same level in the organization. But it seems to struggle to, to move up vertically unless people have a pre-existing strong social tie. So if you know somebody that then gets promoted up the system, your trust bond seems to flow up the system with them. But if you don't know them from when you've been on a, on a level uh, power uh, position, then it tends to be harder to establish trust um, up the system. So it, and it turns out that the very thing we want which is really diagonal structures of power and diversified structures of, um, apologies, not power, trust, and diversified structures of trust um, are quite remarkably hard to build. So even if we are successful at building trust, it will stay within one level. Well, this is very significant for collaboration because it may mean people become effective at collaborating in local team structures, but still remain ineffective at this broad base of collaboration across the organization more widely. So let me jump through my bank, blank slide again and, and just come on to this uh, trust piece again. So what are the factors that affect trust and how specifically does it relate to social leadership? Well, what uh, seems to be very clear is that people judge uh, their leaders upon their actions. So less about the aspirational words that are used and more about the actions that are taken. And so it won't surprise you to hear me say it's often about authenticity. So do your actions match your words? Um, not just at the individual to individual level, but at the sort of senior leader down into the organisational level. So where we've been able to survey in organisations, sometimes at quite large scale, to look for the top traits that people look for in leaders, it's probably no surprise to know that authenticity typically comes up as the, the number one thing that people 
look for. They don't look necessarily for, for vision or heroic status. Um, they're, they're more interested in authenticity of action. They want to have a sense that perhaps the person is trustworthy. So trust and authenticity seem to uh, sit quite closely. One of the things which is very interesting is that I do find that um, organizations tend to fall into two camps. You get those ones which say, we've been here for 140 years, which really means they're quite old and quite often constrained and tends to um, have quite diversified, but often quite stagnated kind of organizational structures versus the younger teenager types of organizations, which interestingly often do have highly cohesive culture. So they will often have a more monoculture kind of staffing. So you'll tend to see more people who are of similar ages, similar backgrounds. And that can give them a certain type of strength and a certain type of weakness. So you can find that, um, that the peer-to-peer -peer and uh, organizational trust can be quite high. But it's often invested in these um, social hero type of leaders. So if you look at some of the new tech companies and the obvious examples, you see that there's this sort of almost quasi-religious status of senior leaders. They are deemed to be highly authentic. They're deemed to be um, socially heroic, um, despite the fact that most people have never met them. That's really quite an interesting feature. You don't tend to get that within, for example, a bank or, um, or in government. You tend to get it more as a feature of young, highly successful, typically global, uh, typically emergent types of organization. So it's really fascinating thinking about this aspect of culture and the role of leadership within it. And then also whether we're actually seeing um, differences in authenticity between true authenticity so your authenticity sits within your actions and the authenticity of these um, social hero type leaders where we have no real direct experience of their actions and yet nonetheless seem to be treating them um, as uh, authentic leaders perhaps the uh, recent uh, downfall of um, uh, of uh, the uber ceo leads us um, to see some of that in action. So somebody who within his organization would have had a high social status for achieving um, certain reach, but then by a wider community was held to account due to a lack of authenticity and indeed a lack of cultural coherence within the organization. So trust is really a fascinating um, aspect of collaboration. Now, again, I'm coming back, I'm repeating a term which I've used before, which is about creating the space. So if collaboration is an emergent feature of a system, perhaps our role as leaders is to create the space for collaboration to occur. And I find myself using this language quite often around a range of areas. I was actually using it this morning with an organization talking about innovation. They say they want to be more innovative. And I'm saying, well, your challenge isn't to put in place an innovation process or an innovation training course, or to find a consultant that can talk to you about innovation. It's to create a space whereby people are able to be innovative. It's often not the case that we have to give people the specific skills or mechanism to do these things. Rather, we have to give them a freedom and a space to do it within. Now, the trust research, again, is quite interesting here because in the prototype work, which was surveying 5,000 people in a global population last year, 54% of people said, if I am trusted by the organization, so if the organization truly trusts me, that will be manifest as freedom. I will have a freedom. And, and you ask, what do you want to do with that freedom? Well, quite interestingly, um, they say, over 30% say, I would like to use that freedom to help others to succeed. Um, and nearly 30% say, I would like to be generous with the things that I know. Uh, into the system, I would like to share into the system. Um, only a small number of people say I would like to earn more money. Most people want to help others to succeed. So we have to create the space for collaboration and support it. Uh, and that will be a, a number of areas. It's enabling it to take place, not owning it. That's quite a key thing, not owning it, but enabling it, nurturing it when we see it happen. And negotiating is, is, is quite important. So we can't tell people to collaborate, but we can perhaps negotiate with them to, um, to surface areas in which they can collaborate. It's probably another key part of freedom 
less being told what to do, more being trusted to find the things to do. So hold on to that notion perhaps of creating space. The role of a social leader is really to hold open a series of spaces. Spaces for storytelling, spaces for collaboration, spaces for co-creation, um, spaces to hear dissenting voices. It's very much that role that whilst the formal leader holds a structural type of power, a social leader holds open spaces to contribute and hear various conversations. So I've talked a little bit about spaces, but of course it's not just space that we need, it's permission as well. You can give people all the space you like and still not get collaboration because something is lacking. And that's quite interesting. Often organizations focus on technology, using technology to create a space, um, but then find that nobody really inhabits that space or a more insidious kind of failure is that people inhabit the space, but they don't really do the things that we're looking for them to do. They're not actually collaborating. Well, permission's an interesting thing, and it's worth remembering that it comes in two flavors. There's a permission which is granted to us. So the organization can give us permission to do something. But the other type of permission is one that's claimed, that somebody just decides to do something. And this ties in to some of the background features of the social age. So in the old world, the mechanisms of production and creativity and achieving effects at scale were owned by the organization. So you were unable to really be effective at scale without the organization sanctioning it or giving you that permission. But of course, what we know in the social age is that the mechanisms of collectivism, of co-creation, of sense-making, and of production and distribution and effectiveness. All of those are democratized, which means today, if you've got a good idea, you're more likely to be able to get something done outside any formal organizational structure through the power of your community, especially if you can collaborate effectively. So we need to think about space and permission, but we also have to recognize that we don't really own either of them. So we can give people a formal space, but a lot of the co-creation and collaboration that takes place won't happen within the formal space. It will happen in fully democratized social spaces. Now, where I've been able to interview about this, to gather some data and some evidence, it's quite hard to do that often because the organization has to be very humble itself and willing to accept it might not hear what it likes. But it probably won't surprise you to know that when you ask people, especially in uh, security environments, regulatory environments, compliance environments. If you can ask them anonymously or without fear of consequence where they collaborate, they will say, well, where will they say? They'll say WhatsApp. They'll say by private email, by text message. They tend to collaborate out of the visibility of the organization. It's not that they won't collaborate in sight, but they are less likely to demonstrate uncertainty. They're less likely to demonstrate their own ignorance. They're less likely to prototype new ideas when it's under the direct oversight of the organization. They'll tend to claim a permission to do that out of sight. And that's interesting. Well, a socially dynamic organization will have to address this. So it will recognize that it can provide a formal space but it won't try to lock that space down. And it will also recognize that people do operate in fully social spaces. And in terms of permission, it may give certain permissions, but it will also recognize that some permission is going to be claimed. And of course, it will have a humility to engage with that claimed permission. So let's think about what, what I mean there. Well, you'll see that in many organizations, they're actually not short of innovation. It's just that a lot of the innovation is taking place out of sight and out of earshot because people are nervous about how it's going to land. Um, indeed, whilst many organizations worry a lot about how they're going to nurture and provoke innovation, it turns out all they need to do is learn to listen to it um, because it often is happening. The interesting thing is in the social age, it's often happening outside the formal structures set up for that very reason. And this leads to a very interesting dynamic. And I've been working with one of the banks recently that's facing exactly this. They've accidentally created 
a fascinating, highly engaged social community, which is solving real business problems, but it's not been done through any formal system or intervention. It's kind of emerged and suddenly become highly effective. And it's unleashed this secondary effect. So because it was never given a permission and it was never given a formal space. In fact, there's almost nothing formal about it, despite almost everybody in the bank knowing it exists and turning to it for help. It's invoked the attention of the formal authorities. So people who are technically responsible for these things that are being solved are saying, well, I need to have a say in that. I need to have some control or ownership. I need to make it safe. But what they actually mean is not safe. What they mean is I need to reinforce my power base and position because my power and pride is held within this formal structure, which it turns out isn't operating as effectively as the social community itself. And that's a fascinating challenge. In the, the work around change, I look at that as a deeply constrained organisation. I'll actually be publishing that work as quite a major book towards the end of, end of the year, looking at um, how organisations change and how we need to take a view of this space and permission and actually devolve and democratise much of it. So the punchline of the book is that we need high levels of individual agency, but we join them up together. We don't try to hold all the agency and control within our formal structural units. We need to give some of it away. So, of course, the collaboration we're looking for in organisations today isn't simple collaboration. It's complex collaboration. It's collaboration in um, disrupted markets, in evolving organisations against a backdrop of busyness. And this is the interesting thing. It's a language I hear time and again in organisations. They express it in different ways. But what they essentially say is this. They say, I am too busy. I'm too busy individually. I'm too busy within this team. I'm too busy organisationally. The organisation has had these spasms of change which have caused team structures to move, people being made redundant, people being brought in, cultural transformation projects, change projects, innovation projects. Everything's happening at once. Organisations rarely feel, oh, here I am. You know, everything's ticking along nicely. I've got time for some considered thinking about what needs to happen next. That's a fiction. For most people, it's busy. And the complex collaboration that they're, that they're taking part in is to try to keep their head above water, not to really take the bold thinking and bold steps needed to ensure that our organisation is changing. And change they must. There's an interesting thing about organisations. There's nothing natural about organisations. They're not written in our DNA. Organisations are a fiction that we've created to meet a particular need within a particular environment. And in the context of the social age, that environment has changed. And hence, the type of organisations that we need is also changing. So then you end up in a space where the organisation thinks, I'm constrained by revenue and finance and sales in the market but actually what they're constrained by is internal conflicted forces. They're constrained by the very great people that made them great, but who are holding them in the current space because their power and their pride, their pride is bound up in the existing space. So to achieve this complex collaboration, we need to develop these high levels of social leadership, people who instead of being held within the formal structure, derive their power and their pride from their reputation within the social community. The organisation can be socially dynamic because of that. I thought I'd share this page with you. This is one of the pages from the book. It's not perhaps particularly relevant to our webinar, but every 10th day, the 100 days book is 100 days of activities on building your social leadership capability. Um, but I put this in here to remind me that, of course, it's about taking action. Social leadership is about doing things differently. It's not a sort of Zen-like reflective type of leadership. It's not an abstract type of leadership. Your social leadership is judged on you actually getting things done for yourself and for others. So I sort of ground myself uh, as, we, as we run through the halfway points to think, yeah, it's about taking action. So any conversation about social leadership should include these words effectiveness and action. So let's think again about some of the specific skills and recognition and respect 
are, are very interesting. Um, recognizing that there's no longer any such thing as career, at least not in the traditional sense. Instead, people will come and go, but they'll remain engaged around the community. We'll have to start thinking within the organizational context, how do we recognize and respect people? And so, so a question I sometimes ask is, you know, does your organization put effort into onboarding people, into bringing them on board, training them up, building their capability so that they're able to be effective within the organization? Most organizations do that. And they also invest in training and development as you move up the formal ladder. So as you take each new role, as you move up the scale, you get given um, the learning, the development, the opportunity as you go. But very few organizations take it to the logical conclusion. When you leave, you know, when people leave the organization, do they, do they send them away with a letter of thanks saying, thank you for everything you've invested in us. This is what we've seen you achieve, how we've seen you grow. This is what we've learned from you. And as you go forward into your new job, how can we help you to be effective? Because this notion of generosity and support isn't just for individuals, it's for organizations as well, especially in a marketplace where those people are going to hold our reputation as they go forward. The reputation of the organization is held by the community. So if we want to collaborate with that community, we'd better ensure we have a strong reputation and our mechanisms of recognition and respect are important for that. The other things that we can think about is because we're dealing in the community space is getting the community to award its recognition and respect. So instead of it being somebody within the senior hierarchy that gets to nominate people, perhaps we just introduce mechanisms whereby the community itself can both nominate and validate the recognition and respect. So for example, the community can vote together um, on what kind of award do we want to give? We want to give an award to somebody who has helped us to be effective, who's been generous with their time, who's been a great mentor, who's led the way, who's challenged authority. It doesn't really matter. The community can take ownership of that and then perhaps also take ownership of the reward itself. And that's interesting because it's counter to the mechanisms used in many organizations to control people. So for example, um, all of the rewards, uh, the contractual element and the fiscal element are held by the organization typically. And they're used to carefully try to dangle carrots in front of people to pull them forward into desired behaviors. But we can relinquish some of that control. We can ask the community what they see, what behaviors they see and what individual activity they see, which is most helpful, and let them own the reward as well. And that's interesting. In a socially dynamic organization, Consequence isn't applied like a spotlight from above shining down. It's also possible for people in the organization to shine the spotlight up or sideways or down or outside. We have far more fluidity of how recognition and respect is held and how consequence is held. And that fluidity of consequence is a sign of a socially dynamic organization. So individually, as leaders, we need to think about the skills that we have for collaboration. How individually are you and me and those around us? How are we um, doing? You know, are we ready for this? Or do we need to revise and amend? And again, this revising and amending process is a continuous cycle. Um, in the social age, we need to constantly go around and think, you know, simple frameworks. What do we need to start doing that we're not doing at the moment? Where is our learning? Do you have a clear view of where your learning is? And does everybody else in your team have that view? What do you need to stop doing? Stopping doing things is one of the greatest gifts we can give ourselves. You know, people quite often ask me how I find time to write because I write every day. And I, I, it's really annoying because I, I can only give the most unhelpful answer I can possibly give, which is to say, I stopped doing all the stuff that got in the way of me writing. And ultimately, that's it. You know, I don't have any more hours in the day and you don't have any more hours in the day. It's only by stopping doing things that we will clear out time and emotional energy and capability to do the things we need to do. And what should we continue doing? And there's real value as part of the social leadership journey to continuously revisit that. Some things we need to be doing now, but we don't need to be doing next month. Some things we need to stop doing now even if we have to start doing them again next month. And some stuff we need to be doing continuously. 
But the interesting thing is that organizations are very good at accreting and codifying systems and structures of things that we should do. But they're remarkably bad at deconstructing that structure. So they, they go through this mindset. I usually call it caging complexity. They, they put in place rules and systems and mechanisms and reporting structures, all of which allow them to do one thing well, but stop them changing actively to do other things. If we can just take the brush and sweep out the old, then we can probably be more effective. I mean, the sad truth is that many organizations would probably be more effective if they ditched their entire controlling structure and rebuilt it every year because they, they'd forget to put back in place some of the controls that were there before and possibly in that space that is liberated and the permission that's claimed around it, people would end up being more effective. I had a very interesting experience interviewing people in a pharmaceutical company which invests a lot of time and energy to bring together cohorts of 30 people to um, explore new ways of solving intractable problems. And as part of the membership of that community, they get to tear up the rules of the organization. They can define their own reporting structures, they can define um, their working practices. And they're typically highly successful. They put four groups of these people through every year. They're very successful. But one of the things that was interesting from the interviews I did was um, that the two common uh, themes emerged. The first is that people uh, said uh, it was absolutely it was a fantastic experience I got a lot out of it by being able to be freed from all of this constraint and the second thing which I found fascinating was they said I almost never tell anybody I was on the program and they don't tell people they were on the program because they said people hate people that are on the program they say of course you were wildly successful I would be wildly successful if I didn't have to put up with all this nonsense that's that's forced onto me and that's, for me, that's interesting because the organization is spending all this money and they're learning the lesson. They're just not doing anything with the lesson. Where is the space outside that formal program for all the other brilliant people to be effective at scale? So revising and amending our skills and our mindset is very important. Indeed, one of our responsibilities as social leaders is to remove the friction from the system. And in fact, I drew this slide, which is, is meant to represent a, a, a sort of set of gears. Um, but you'll notice that I'm no mechanic, but uh, there we go. I was working with one of the aerospace companies and uh, I, I've been working with their chief exec for a while talking about you know, what his role was. And we sort of settled on this language that it, his role is to remove the friction from the system. He doesn't specifically have to put energy into the system. He doesn't have to specifically give people answers what he has to do is remove the friction. And that kind of translates into this to create space for people to be effective. So individually, we should probably be asking ourselves that question. Am I adding friction into the system? Am I stood at the top pouring sand into the gears? Or am I carefully removing that friction at every point within the system? And this speaks to the, the socially dynamic organization. A socially dynamic organization will be one which is full of people, all of whom are doing that fine tuning. It's a devolved capability and responsibility. So the dynamic nature of a socially dynamic organization comes from, the clue is in the title, the social piece, it comes from the individuals and the ways that they are engaged within their communities. So if you looked at this engine of the socially dynamic organization, what would you see? Well, you'd see, trust threaded throughout it. You'd see broad and diversified networks of strong social ties. You'd see high individual agency, strong social leadership skills, a strong ability to collaborate, not just within a formal system doing a sanctioned thing, but within a social system doing the things that need to be done. And you'd see a humility on the part of the organization to hear those stories, to hear what it is that needs to be done. So what does that come down to then at the individual level? Well, in the, in the spirit of working out loud, sharing this illustration, you'll, you'll have to decide where you sit on this one. Some people say kol, kolol, lolk, but it's actually supposed to say collaboration, uh, but you have to kind of read up and down the legs a bit. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's about, you know, collaboration is, is what you do 
not what you say. I guess I could almost redraw this badly for many of the other words that we hear flowing around the organizations around us. You know, it, uh, leadership is about what you do, not what you say. It's actions that count. So if we want to see collaboration at scale, if we want to see that complex collaboration, then we have to take the actions that will enable that to happen. And we can probably think about it in some very specific terms. We can think about, well, what do we do to build out the high trust networks? And if you're interested in that, um, if you look over on the blog and just search for projection of trust, if you search for those words, you'll find two articles. One is a, a new visualization I've been using, building out of the trust research, which takes this notion of how it is that trust is formed. It looks at how we possibly project aspects of trust onto other people. And then the second piece is looking at how communities form and how trust flows through those systems. And I'm quite interested in that because even in culturally toxic organizations, you find there are strong trust networks. They're just held very locally. They're very strongly tribal units. Um, and within that work, I've started to look at aspects of in-group, near-group, and out-of-group. And as people move from out-group through to in-group, they start to be subject to greater social consequence. And social consequence is a really massive inhibitor of individual behavior. It's really very fascinating the strength of social consequence i felt this myself i'm just back from america and one of the things i notice when i'm in america is i become remarkably well behaved when i cross the road so where i live here or if i'm in london if there's a gap i'll just go for it i'll just run across the road but when i'm in america i end up standing with 30 other people looking at a red light with no traffic coming but i'm unwilling to break ranks and be the person that runs across or walks across when it's red because nobody else does that. Now, I'm probably not going to be arrested for just nipping across the road, but I know that people will be looking at me and I can feel that social consequence holds me in place. Even though I know it, I still do it because we're afraid of being sort of out group. So if we want to think about individual behaviors, understanding social consequences is remarkably important. So collaboration is probably something we need to role play. Um, and role play with a with a humility as we do so. So um, I'll sort of start to draw things um, together here. Uh, so collaboration in the context of the social leadership uh, frame, which I use the net model, is um, is the, the the top tier of that model. We we run through it in a minute. Actually, I'll bring up the model and, and look through it. Um, but we need to be thinking about how these skills come together. Are we ready to learn to be a more effective social leader? Well, I sort of come back to this uh, slide because humility is a, is a sort of interesting thing. You, you can't stand up and say, I am humble. Um, you can only be judged as humble by others within your team and within your community. And I do sort of wrestle with this because I, I, I do believe that humility is uh, at the heart of social leadership. Um, but I also uh, try to recognize that maybe that's because I'm, I'm sort of liberal in my views and take a fairly gentle view of leadership. I, I feel that, um, you know, some of the um, frames of leadership that involve uh, showing you some rugby players and uh, a national sports team and a picture of a lion, they're, they're possibly a little outdated. They're probably some kind of testosterone-driven fiction that was never really true anyway, uh, but they feel particularly out of kilter in the social age. I doubt whether anybody um, gets to be highly respected within their broad community if they demonstrate those kind of aggressive, assertive forms of leadership. You can, of course, become um, very well accepted uh, within a niche community by doing that. But again, I, I view that the role of social leaders is to cross the organization. In fact, to do so with humility, to hear stories of difference. I've been working this week with the National Health Service in the UK, and I've come back to this time and again. The, the National Health Service, um, uh, for those of you that know it, is an interesting organization because it, it's vast. It's reckoned to be one of the largest organizations in the world, and it's deeply riven 
by differences of, of view. It's driven between practitioners, between nurses and consultants and accountants and leaders and politicians and everybody else. And, and, and it's very hard to understand, um, you know, how can we move outside our, our immediate communities who probably largely agree with what we think into these spaces of difference. And yet that's exactly what social leaders do. They don't just seek to hear stories they want to hear. They seek to engage in communities and hear stories of difference and to do so with a humility to listen to those stories and then to help articulate and re-articulate them. We can only really affect change, especially in intractable systems, by hearing and documenting and sharing stories of our difference. Because the interesting thing is that the strength of a socially dynamic organisation won't come from conformity. It's not about trying to think, get everybody to think the same or to be like us. It's actually about recognising and respecting the difference, but finding our common threads forward. Our diversity may very well be a strength. So if we think about this journey through social leadership, you know, it starts with curation on the left, choosing our space. What will we be known for? about understanding stories and the many different ways that they flow through organisations, about how we ourselves don't just passively push formal stories through the system, we interpret them to make them relevant and timely for others. And also, we become great story listeners, hearing the wisdom of the community itself and doing so with a humility to learn from it, not to own or control it. We share widely but wisely. We don't add noise in the system. We help to filter out the signal. Those are the foundations of social leadership. Then we move into thinking about community. Where are our different communities? Which ones do we need to start? Which ones do we need to leave? Which ones are we just learning in? Which are we participating in and so forth and so on? What's our role and what's the purpose of those communities? Once we've mapped out that environment, we can earn our reputation through our actions. Remember I said collaboration is about actions. You know, we have to take action and on the basis of that action, and if it's authentically taken, we will earn reputation. And then this magical step from reputation into social authority. If we earn the right type of reputation, we may be awarded the social authority that will allow us to be effective in these spaces. But we can't buy it and we can't demand it. We have to earn it which really is where that humility comes in as well. Beyond that, if we have social authority, we can move into co-creation. We can actually get down to the nitty gritty of figuring stuff out and getting stuff done. To do that, we need social capital and ability to survive and thrive in these spaces and to help others to do so. And you'd have heard that theme of helping others repeatedly through this. We are successful ourselves through our willingness and ability to help others. And then finally into collaboration, you know, how we collaborate widely and deeply inside the organisation and outside it as well. So that uh, brings us to the end really of this exploration about collaboration. There is, um, as Paul said at the start, all of the previous webinars are, are on the website. Um, there's one more webinar in this series which is about social leadership in practice. And that will really be looking at how we draw it all together. Uh, I'm then looking at what we do beyond this. We'll almost certainly be doing uh, an expanded series of webinars around trust. And then I think I'll be looking at repeating a series of social leadership webinars uh, with a focus on this in practice and within organisations. But stay tuned for that. Uh, and if you've enjoyed it, um, if you don't have a copy of the book, just drop me a note um, afterwards. I will happily... Uh, this is the 100 days book and the uh, handbook. I'll happily share a copy out if you uh, drop me a note to do that. But we've got a, a few minutes left. I think if anybody has any questions, Paul is going to help us to moderate or explore that. Hi, everybody, and thanks for that, Julian. That was very interesting. Um, as Julian's just said, we've got some, uh, a couple of minutes left for some questions here at the end. Um, I'll just start off with one if I might. Julian, based on um, some of the things you were saying there. Um, if a social leader uh, is working under a substructure of a more authoritarian man management system presently, what are the kind of quick wins that could be demonstrated from collaboration? And are these in fact needed? Is it just a case of building social capital at whatever level you are within an organisation, just waiting for the tide to turn into this uh, 
a more social leadership um, style organization. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. It ties into the notion of how organisations change. And I do subscribe to some of the tipping point theories. You know, we'll only change an organisation when we get a certain critical mass moving in the right direction. One of the real, you know, people often say, how will we know when we're winning at this? How will we know when the organisation is starting to become socially dynamic? And the, the answer, the only answer I can really give is we'll, we'll know it when we start to hear stories of dissent is, is one part. So when we ha start to hear stories of difference figured out by the community flowing up the organization, then we'll know that we're on the route to becoming socially dynamic. But we'll know that we're truly achieving it when the organization is ready to hear those stories and take action based upon it. So if we're within a strongly formal structure which doesn't want to hear it, the kind of the first steps that we can take is to find a storytelling voice. So the ability to carry out an individual personal narrative of reflection because that doesn't require anything except a claimed permission and it can't really do any harm except to share ideas and if an organization is afraid of shared ideas then probably the more fundamental question is should i still be in this organization um, but we really look to inspire change rather than um, rather than wait for there to be a formal project which drives change it's all about being the change that, that you want to be i, I, I imagine it's change is always about individual agency. Most large scale organizational change projects fail because they're not really change projects. They're just expressions of formal power tinkering with the Lego bricks and changing the structures around the formal structures. They don't address the underlying social structures and the true power sits in the underlying social structure. I suppose to that point, it, it does reinforce the point that organizations as a whole are not this artificial monolith that, that can't be changed that can only be changed all in one go. I mean, there are deep pockets within that that are uh, social systems within their own right that, that, that can be improved and, and expanded upon. Absolutely, the, the constraint comes at that meta level. So you will often find that even constrained organizations have highly innovative pockets, but they're just being innovative locally and they're not sharing it globally because consequences applied if they share it globally. So what we really need to do is build out those networks of strong social ties, open up the storytelling channels and find our momentum within the system. Again, why many formal change programs fail is because they try to impose the energy for change from outside. But if you push a system, it's, it, it, it's static until you push it. And once you stop pushing, it tends to stagnate again. A socially dynamic system is self-starting and self-sustaining because it's powered by the individual agency of everybody in the organization. Yeah. Fascinating, thank you very much. Uh, I've certainly learned quite a bit there. Um, I don't think we have any questions on the, um, on the chat and we're just drawing up to the hour. So I'll just thank you for your time, uh, Julian, and your presentation. Uh, oh, we've got a late, oh, a late bid. Let's, let's go to Sarah's. I think you can see that, Julian. In there, I'm just having a look at that. Uh, so I'm collaborating and leading within a new team. The team are new to the organization, including myself. There's one person who's not new to the organization who's struggling with this change. All that I do is question and oh, you know, there's negativity in the questioning. I have to slightly uh, pause to apologize at this point. I don't know if any of you have ever um, had the delight of a visual migraine. It's, uh, it's where you feel absolutely fine, but your eyesight starts to uh, go a little peculiar. And I, I have that at the moment. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm just trying to read the text on the screen. So I'm afraid I can't quite read the end of that. Paul, would you just read out uh, the last? Yes, no, uh, no problem. Um, uh, all that I do is questioned and negativity is brought with it. I welcome all views and feedback, but it is now becoming exhausting. But I want some guidance on the best way to to feel this I imagine is this a good thing to do sorry I was typing fast eek <laughs> so no it's good good typing well done um, uh, so I think um, there's a really uh, fascinating part of being a, a new leader and within a, a new team um, and it, it, it's about um, it, so in social leadership terms I'd start with that curation piece the type of leader that you will be and your willingness to um, almost expose your, your vulnerability, your uncertainty. Um, and funnily enough, this is something uh, that I, I hear quite strongly in uh, military contexts where new and emergent leaders say, I, I need to be uh, dynamic and kinetic. I need to be seen to get stuff done. But I also need 
to to show a, a humility and a willingness to uh, to listen and learn. And how do I reconcile those two things? Well, strangely enough, people are generally quite open to that. So perhaps the the, the, the sort of the quick advice I could give you would be to find your storytelling space. So maybe it's a, a reflective blog or a, a, um, a somewhere where you're able to share your thoughts and reflections. And then over time, you can start to ask other people within that team more widely to engage within that. So perhaps you could ask them to, to share their own view and you can then start to, to collaborate around those um, different views. But if you um, drop me a note, Sarah, afterwards, I'll share a couple of articles with you uh, specifically uh, around that quite happily. It's particularly interesting, actually, on Sarah's point that the one person who is struggling with the new way of doing things is the person who's been most established w within that team, who is legacy uh, in that team. So I, I think this is probably a very common situation. Very much, especially because um, a key part is that all these people, you know, people that we see who may be resistant are actually brilliant people just like you and me. They're just in a different space and, and a different uh, base of, of power, effectively. So um, we're not surrounded by people that are trying to thwart us. We're just surrounded by people who are trying to be alternatively successful. So that our way to collaborate is to find that sort of shared space and vision. Um, so that's, that's really a key, key aspect of change. Great. I hope that's answered your, uh, your question, Sarah. Uh, so I will probably sign off at this point. Uh, thank you again. Thank you to all the people who've attended today. Uh, as Julian has mentioned, Social Leadership in Practice is the last of our series, and we're going to be holding that webinar on November the 14th. So do come along and sign up for that if you can. It's going to be great. Um, so further to that, I'll just say goodbye now and um, have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.